right. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started, everyone. Um, welcome. My name is Sarah Carr, and I am coordinator of the Coastal Marine Ecosystem-Based Management Tools Network and editor of the newsletter, the Skimmer on Marine Ecosystems and Management. Both are um, services at Octo, Open, Open Communications for the Ocean. Um, we're very uh, pleased to welcome you today to today's webinar, which is part of our um, webinar series. We host webinars two to three times a month. Um, we have three wonderful panelists today and two <laughs> wonderful moderators. Our chief moderator is Peter Edwards from the Pew Charitable Trust. And he's joined by John Fisher, also from the Pew Charitable Trust, who got all this rolling um, several years ago. Um, I'm going to leave them to introduce the panelists um, and Peter specifically. But before we get started, I wanted to give everyone an idea of how the webinar will run. We will um, have some introductory remarks um, by the, the panelists after um, Peter's welcome. And then um, we you can send in questions and comments and thoughts on what the presenters, uh, the panelists are, are presenting about um, through the both the, the chat panel. Um, you you can, are able to share your thoughts um, with everyone uh, through the chat panel, so or just send it to the panelists or the moderators. We just ask that you keep it professional and using that, that, that power because you can share with everyone. Um, and also we have a really cool functionality. Um, you can also post questions in the question panel and it's open for upvoting. So you can see everyone else's questions and if there's something you're particularly interested in, you can upvote that question um, and hopefully we can get to it. Um, um, during the presentation. Um, but thank you everyone for being here and I'll turn it over to Peter now. Thank you, Sarah, and welcome everyone. Um, we have a short time slot to get through a lot of interesting conversations, so I, I, I won't be too long. Um, as you said, my name is Peter Edwards. I'm an economist and I work at the Pew Charitable Trust with our conservation science unit. We're kind of nested within the research and science portfolio at Pew Charitable Trust. Today, we have an esteemed panel of, um, of, of, of folks, marine policy and science professionals um, from various um, places in the globe. As Sarah mentioned, John Fisher had started a series of these conversations more loosely around the theme of kind of um, research impact and, and learning from you know, failures and, and, and also successes and how we can move from the science to policy um, realm or, or better improve that. Um, some of the previous talks, uh, most of the, the panelists were from kind of a Western or, or European context. So today we thought we'd um, invite some colleagues um, from the Caribbean, um, Latin America and, um, and Africa to share their, their perspectives on a topic around how science influences policy or coastal and marine policy um, and to, to provide their perspectives. So um, today we have, um, Nicole Leotard from um, Leotard from the Canary Caribbean Natural Resources Institute. We also have Rodrigo Arriagada from the University of Catolica de Chile and David Aburo from Cordio in East Africa. So I won't go into any too long bios because we're, we've asked them to, to kind of introduce themselves as well and provide some context for conversation today. So I think I will, um, I will have Nicole kick off with her extended introduction and then she'll hand it over to David and then David to Rodrigo. Remember to unmute. Thank you very much Peter and it's so lovely to be here with with you and with everyone. Um, thank you for having me. Um, I work with the Caribbean Natural Resources Institute or Canary. Um, which obviously works across the entire Caribbean region. We're a regional nonprofit technical institute. And um, you see our vision and mission. We are really about sustainable development that recognizes that a healthy environment is central to economic, social, human development. And so our mission is focused on stewardship of these natural resources, which are essential for people's well being and livelihoods. And our um, work is focused on these five program areas, which one of which is focused on biodiversity and ecosystems and their conservation and sustainable use, restoration, wise management. Um, but we also work on resilience, particularly resilience to climate and natural disasters, which are huge in the Caribbean and globally, of course. 
um, we do a lot of work on equity and justice, including work on green and blue economies and sustainable local livelihoods, as well as participatory ecosystem governments, so engaging stakeholders. So therefore our work really, we're not just a research institute, but we do grounded, relevant, applied research to inform policy, to be the basis that creates knowledge, to build capacity, to bring stakeholders together. So the kinds of research we do um, includes quite a lot on, on collecting local knowledge, participatory research, citizen science, and we do a lot of connecting scientists to policy makers, to other stakeholders on the ground, to the people who use natural resources, who use our oceans and need them for their livelihoods. So we're very much that kind of a bridge um, between scientists and policy makers and, and other stakeholders. I have five kind of key thoughts that I wanted to put out for discussion today, um, which I hope we have a lot of time for questions and discussion. So the first thought is from the Caribbean experience, from Canaries experience, science needs to firstly respond to actual policy needs that are expressed by policymakers, um, not kind of think what is put perhaps interesting to them, but really take the time to engage with policymakers in conversations um, and develop a research agenda, ideally a collaborative research agenda. So the example I've put up here, which I think is really positive, the Gulf and Caribbean Fisheries Institute, GCFI, um, has developed a draft research agenda doing exactly that, which they developed by bringing together scientists and policymakers from around the wider Caribbean and North Brazil shelf. Um, so what we call the CLME plus region. Um, and this research agenda then lays out what are the actual research priorities that we need in this region to inform governance of our ocean resources, which are so critical for economic development and our people. So I think this is really where we'd like to see um, scientists connect with policymakers upfront in terms of finding out what the priorities are. The second idea I wanted to share is um, really the importance of countries and governments and other stakeholders ensuring that research in their country, in their region benefits them. So this example I thought was just fascinating, the tiny island of Montserrat, which is perhaps best known for a massive volcanic eruption, which made two thirds of the island um, uninhabitable for many years. It's just opening up slightly now. Um, and they are a territory of the United Kingdom and have some fantastic biodiversity, endemic plants and animals and so on and therefore are very popular for research. And, you know, the government and other stakeholders said, we find out about research being done here when we go online and, and we see people have done research in our island and we don't even know about it. And this is an island of less than 5,000 people, all right? So they developed, the government developed this, what they call their research protocol and laid out this vision that I'm showing on the screen. And I think, it's really um, important for researchers to try and put themselves in the shoes of local stakeholders, stakeholders from the country and say, well, what do they want from my research? And I think some of the ideas here perhaps would be surprising to some researchers and I'd love to get reactions. You know, um, the government wants to see, um, for example, biodiversity research promote careers in science in, in, in young people from Montserrat. It wants to see science respond to the local needs for how they manage their island. And so really, I think this is a very important um, idea that scientists need to keep in mind, um, even when countries do not have strong research protocols and so on, um, to discuss with local stakeholders, well, how can my research benefit you? 
The third idea um, is about developing equitable partnerships and building local capacity. So directly building on that, um, Montserrat itself actually has some great um, best practice where the Royal Society for Protection of Birds, RSPB, run a huge um, project uh, aiming to conserve the forests and resources in Montserrat. And they had a, a project manager on staff and they also hired a local counterpart project manager and local staff. So very clear and deliberate building local capacity. And this is the visit of um, Prince Charles and, and Camilla there in the bottom picture and standing there are the, the RSPB staff as well as the local counterparts part staff. So a really powerful relationship and partnership there. The other set of logos I think is an example of where um, research institutes should develop equitable partnerships. So Canary was part of this partnership called the Independent Research Forum uh, where research institutes around the world collaborated to provide scientific input into development of the sustainable development goals. So I think there are all kinds of, of equity issues that scientists need to pay attention to and deliberately build local capacity in your work. The fourth idea is around, um, what I touched on earlier, Canary does a lot of this. Look at how scientific research can be complemented by um, local and traditional knowledge. So using things like participatory research, such as in science, and Canary uses a lot of innovative ICT tools, um, participatory GIS, participatory three-dimensional modeling, um, participatory video, photo journaling, uh, where we really get local people to um, think about what science means in their context. So a lot of our work is taking climate science, for example, and helping local people to do participatory vulnerability analysis and climate adaptation planning in their local context. So bringing together science and local and traditional knowledge, I think is something all researchers should, should strive to do where possible. The final idea is around um, scientists really, if we're trying to influence policy and practice and make a difference, we need to be better communicators, but to also recognize that communication and facilitation of stakeholder engagement is an expert field in its own right. And therefore um, finding partners like Canary and many others who are skilled communicators and skilled facilitators can really help to enhance the science you do and ensure that the science you do directly influences policy. Um, so I have lots of good examples of where that has happened um, and lots of good examples of where we see in scientists be good communicators. For example, the IPCC um, authors, there's several scientists there who I think are powerful communicators, but still they are really backed up by a team of, of communication and facilitation professionals. So Peter, that's it for me. Um, thank you very much for your time and looking forward to discussions and questions. And I think I hand straight over to David. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicole. And good evening, good afternoon, good morning to everybody. It's a great uh, pleasure to be here um, on this great forum. Nice to see some familiar names in, in the attendees list as well. Uh, bring us all together while we still can't travel. So um, I don't have a presentation to give, but I'll give some more um, off the cuff remarks. So building on a lot of what Nicole has presented. So it's fantastic having such a, a structured um, introduction to all of that. I'll give you a quick introduction uh, of myself. So I'm David Abura, I'm a coral reef biologist. I'm based in Mombasa in Kenya and I'm Kenyan. Uh, and my organization, Cordio East Africa, is a nonprofit research organization. And we started 20 years ago responding to the first global bleaching events and the impacts in the Western Indian Ocean and really built up to build capacity in coral reef monitoring and greater integration amongst the countries um, and really supporting different teams uh, in the nine countries of the Western Indian Ocean um, to collect better data and work on coral reef sustainability. And then from that as a basis, we've really um, 
worked a lot on climate vulnerability of coral reefs, as well as small scale fisheries and working with local communities around the limits to the productivity of, of a reef system, but then also how to engage and build capacity in local management and agency of the communities to, uh, to take some control of, of the livelihoods and the management of their resources and work with the government and with other NGOs in, in trying to get to a common goal. So in that sense, with the topic of this seminar, we really are sort of sitting as a networking organization. We bridge across the countries in the region. So communicating a lot between the countries. We work with other scientists. We work with NGOs. And we work with communities on the ground as well. And we also link to the international community. So the funding that we get comes from abroad, uh, from Europe and the US mostly. Um, but then also, of course, reporting into the scientific and policy and management communities internationally is a big part of what we do and trying to present the East African perspective, our experience and the experience of those that we work with on the ground. <clears throat> so we've had quite a lot of, you know, a lot of years of working in this space and with uh, other researchers coming into to the region and doing research. I mean, a, a term that's used a lot in this session is a study of parachute research um, and of course it's it's certainly something to um to to ward off and guard against i think it's really important not to let terms like that you know poison the discourse around the collaborative nature of research um, you know research really moves forward not only within disciplines but by people working together um, scientists and then also with the um with the researchers that are hired, the communities they work with, um, the context that we all live and work in. And I think that collegial nature and the openness of research is, is something to really um, cherish and value and be very careful not to undermine that with, you know, over strict uh, structures and things like that. Um, the African context with this, of course, we've had quite a lot of research researchers coming in from the West, particularly from Europe initially with uh, the histories of colonialism that we've had. Um, there are, of course, sensitivities uh, around um, foreigners coming in to do research and to what extent are the research findings really uh, addressing local needs and then feeding back into local needs and management um, entities and also building up the research community. But this kind of relationship you know, is translated also into contemporary relationships of, you know, the buildup of elite cultures and the intelligentsia and those who have education, those that don't. Um, we have similar dynamics within countries and among different social and or ethnic identities uh, within national structures that we need to break down. So it is hard to, to rational, uh, to generalize uh, and very important to, to not overgeneralize and to really address um, to, to address the challenges that we face. And sometimes with the challenges that we face uh, in, um, in, in any context, uh, whether here in Africa or, or in, in other continents, it's sometimes better for foreigners to come in and to lead a, quest, a questioning process than for locals to do it because of their sort of distance from the issues and ability to, uh, you know, to perhaps be a bit roughshod uh, and shake things up where local sensibilities don't really allow local scientists to do that. So there's, there's values in that as well. But of course, the question then is, so if I address a couple of questions and it's, you know, whose questions are driving the research? Um, and now we use the term co-design uh, as is, is the buzzword that's in now, but of course, making sure that local question and needs are being addressed, uh, paying attention to the local context and to necessary local partners for working, uh, for conducting research and embedding it in local structures and, and the benefits. The policy and management needs uh, and priorities, of course, need to be firmly in focus, as Nicole mentioned. Um, but it's also, you know, my organization, we work very much on applied research, but we also have a basic research component, you know, to what we do as well. And I think it's really important that we don't undermine the the need to really stimulate and motivate uh, innovation and and you know forward thinking and and some of those great ideas that will come out of basic research 
particularly in, in national institutions and research frameworks where you have you know gifted individuals coming through and to really make sure we're investing in in that thought process as well as the important priorities that, that we need to to address in development a big issue is around not just the questions but then who writes uh who's writing what is coming out so who is communicating who frames the question the answers and the outcomes um you know history is written by the winners at the moment research outputs are really written by the global north um rather than the global south and it's a and i think that's one of the bigger challenges um you know perhaps a bit more than parachute research per se is to really not just in, in a way that term makes us look outwards and try and stop certain things from happening but what we really need to do is to empower um you know the voices of multiple research groups so we face this in publishing all the time you know uh, trying to get african author groups for example to get papers into major journals is is a huge challenge um, and being able to to get through with the topics that we that we focus on with the geographic or thematic foresight that we have uh, you know, English language can be a challenge, of course, uh, for, for many publishing uh, in, in the international literature. And so really breaking open those boundaries, I think, is, is, a, is a critical part of this question about research partnership and power in research and who holds that. Building capacity is, is very necessary, building people's careers. But it's not necessarily just a one way street. It's not just, you know, um, researchers or the global north coming in and being able to teach those in the global south, but coming in and learning as well. Um, and I think the um, I think it's the importance of that that, that I'll finish with is the, the the importance of the collaboration between researchers is critical. Um, and one of the biggest signs of that, I feel, is that in working with Kenyans over here, we, we hire mostly Kenyans in our organization. Uh, we build their careers, many stay with us a few years and then move on to other things. But I think one of the most important parts of a Kenyan scientist's career is studying abroad for a certain amount of time. Now, whether it's a master's or a PhD or a short course, it really opens the mind. And so I think really breaking down the, uh, the barriers that we have around these sort of research relationships that we have to make sure that they are, they are really um, valuing and strengthening different voices is, is the critical thing. So thanks, I'll, I'll finish with that. And with that, I think I hand over to Rodrigo. Okay, uh, thank you, David. Um, well, I'm, I'm going to share my screen very briefly. Let me... Okay, so this is just uh, some ideas that I want to add to this uh, interesting conversation. Um, well, first of all, a little bit about about myself, I'm an environmental economist living here in Santiago in Chile. I'm, I'm the director of a research center is the Millennium Nucleus Center for the Socioeconomic Impact of Environmental Policies. This is a, it's a local research center that has been um, studying the, the, the sustainability of public policies through the understanding and measurement of uh, the causal relationship that exists between environmentally relevant policies and various measures of welfare. So, so the, the, the core of our, of our research um, agenda is, is, is adding this um, uh, social component in the sense that in, in the middle of our policy making process of, of designing and impl in, in implementing environmental uh, policies with the environmental objectives, we strongly believe that, that, that the key issue that we need to better understand um, is the issue related with behavioral adjustments uh, that um, in, in, in many ways um, are, are aligned with the, with the success or failure of these uh, impacts. So this is what we have been doing in the last 10 years. Um, our our re current research motivation, I would say, uh, we believe that to solve um, environmental problems, we definitely need to better understand the the relations the relations between humans and nature. And this could sound a little bit cliche, but um, we we I, I really understand what what's the link between our own well-being and the surrounding environment and how this 
are connected. Uh, we also believe that we need to bring more of the behavioral sciences to environmental programs and policies. At the end, uh, through environmental policies, we are not intending to affect the environment. Uh, I mean, we, 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 we need to affect first uh, human beings, uh, which are the, in, in, in many cases, uh, the agents that are related with, with, with degradation of resources or, or, or even in, on, on a more positive side, uh, when local communities can engage in a more sustainable way to um, use their resources is, 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 uh, is key to trying to understand uh, what, what are the motivations uh, behind those, those kind of behaviors. Uh, to better connect science and policy, we, we definitely need, we need to add more science, but, but we need to be very careful um, in, in which stage of the policy cycle we are injecting science. Because we, we, sometimes we, 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 we tend to use science after the policy has been implemented. So we, 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 we're trying to provide strong, rigorous uh, scientific evidence of, on the impact of policies. Uh, but we still, there are plenty of room to use more science during the design of policies. In, in, in Chile, it's, it's, it's very clear that we don't, we don't use science when we are writing policies. So, so when we want to evaluate those policies, uh, there is no one strategy uh, that is being designed before the implementation phase. So, so uh, our life could be, make a lot easier if, if, we, if we start to think in the whole policy cycle when connecting science and policy. And if we are learning from experience and we are injecting rigorous scientific evidence on the impact of policy to connect, to better connect the policy outcomes um, um, for future, future policies, uh, we need to start thinking about the institutional arrangements and the, the changes in governance regimes. So we are learning from, from past experience. Of, so how we are gonna start doing things in, in a different way. So, so sometimes institutional arrangements are, are very important. Well, sorry, this is in Spanish. So the, uh, talking about various um, language barriers. Um, our centers basically deal with the role of science in, in, in environmental governance. Uh, providing a very strong base of scientific evidence um, to feed the design of policies. Um, and, and basically we are studying three things, uh, connection between, between uh, human well-being well and, 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 and surrounding environment, causal mechanisms, impacts, and heterogeneity of impacts uh, of specific policies, and how these policies can change behavior and how these changes in behavior end up uh, uh, causing effects in policy results. So uh, what, what is, is, it, is interesting from, from a, a local perspective at least is if you want to profile the role of science in the case of the Chilean, it's not um, so, so, so how, how is, what kind of role is, is currently the science playing in the design, implementation, and evaluation of policies in general. And, and, and we have been using uh, several uh, sources of information, our local country reports, the OECD environmental performance reports, uh, that Chile is part of the OECD, so now we need to engage in, this, in these uh, reports. Um, and annual country level presidential reports, and even in that case, it's, it's pretty hard to um, um, develop a good profiling of the role of, of the current role of science in the Chilean case. Um, our very broad uh, conclusions about that as in, 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 the, in the case of Chile, scientific knowledge is not playing a key role um, in, 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 this, in, in the several stages of the policy cycle. Uh, scientific knowledge is, knowledge is not supporting in any way the definition of country level environmental challenges so sometimes our environmental agenda is set by politicians uh, and there is no scientific evidence of those challenges, why, why those challenges are the most important. Um, the, the design and evaluation of environmental relevant policies is still mainly based on intuition and anecdotal evidence. 
so, so a lot of room to inject more science and connect science with policies. Um, I'm, I'm going to skip this. Um, so, so going back to, to what, what Nico was saying, the role of science communication uh, in, in, in our understanding and from our own experience, this is, is part of the key. How we co communicate our science in a way that uh, can be used for potential knowledge users. And, and, and another, another issue that uh, I think some, some, some of the previous speakers mentioned, uh, we are talking about building capacity, um, but building capacity in the policy community is very important. This is part of our uh, activities with, with the Ministry of the Environment um, and forest officials and uh, marine officials too, um, and how to use science to make better decisions. That's, that's something a politician doesn't know. I mean, where's, where is the good science located? How I can use science in my decision? So sometimes training program in, in that sense could, could help a lot in, 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 in speed up the process of, of using more science in, 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 in policy decisions. So this is just an example of, of uh, a, 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 a visit in a couple of years ago, pre-pandemia, of course, visiting the Ministry of the Environment and the Environmental Agency in UK. And this is just uh, a bunch of people from our Ministry of the Environment. Um, so so uh, this, this is a, actually uh, a, in, in, inside our uh, local parliament, we also have a special unit uh, that is, is, is specialized in, in providing scientific advice to, uh, to Congress people. And, and, and those people also um, uh, sometimes are, 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 are very keen in, in receiving this kind of training, okay? Um, so so just, just, just to, uh, I'm gonna throw a, a, just a, some ideas to, to start the conversation. Uh, in order to move, move it forward, we, we, we definitely need to better uh, match uh, the current knowledge with current gaps redefine the concept of relevant knowledge. So, so in my case, uh, I'm a faculty in a local university, so my, my knowledge is gonna be relevant uh, if I, I'm gonna be able to publish uh, this knowledge in, in very good journals. Um, uh, so if, if that uh, science pro provoke or cause a, a local impact in the way we are making decision, probably that's not the way that we are evaluating at least the uh, uh, scholars here in, in Chile. And maybe this is the same thing in, in, in many other places around the world. Okay, so, so now I'm, I'm gonna um, uh, uh, hand it over to, to Peter, right? Yep. Thanks, Rodrigo. And um, thanks, thanks to all our presenters. And I think we've given up ourselves some time to, to field some questions. Um, we have a lot of good questions. And I think um, John is helping kind of curate the, the ones that have been voted upwards. But I'd like to kind of use um, um, the privilege of my facilitation role to kind of dig a little deeper on some of the things that I, I heard. I think, um, Rodrigo, your last slide um, encapsulated some themes that I think all of you kind of presented um, in terms of like, matching the kind of knowledge gaps with, with the need, um, 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 alignment of incentives and, 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 and also kind of the very important role of kind of participatory and interdisciplinary approaches. But more, and I think most importantly, certainly as David and Nicole had also mentioned, um, that aspect of, of kind of communicating the information at the different levels and also kind of like who is writing these stories. I think um, David, your point about um, African and other kind of regional ac academics not being able to publish as, as they'd like to for various buyers, perhaps in you know, all of the research being centered in other places, um, it doesn't pick up the interest. Um, so, so I think those are some good points to build up. But one of the questions that I'd like to ask before kind of leading to one of the questions from the audience, and I think I might know the answer, are in, any, in all of your cases, are there any examples of legal or kind of like quasi-governmental institutional requirements to kind of use the research that either you're doing or facilitating, um, or, or is it really just depending on the goodwill of government agencies or other kind of major policy bodies to, bodies to utilize the information? I'll start with um, Nicole. 
correct that. I am not aware of any legal requirements to use the findings of science and research. I suppose I can come on top of that. I suppose it's the same in Kenya, but I mean, the, when, when you look at the policies and laws, I mean, I think they, 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 they do require consultation periods and they do require, you know, that, that information is gathered. Uh, but often it's a matter of capacity to be able to, to incorporate and use the information, not just in preparing new laws or regulations, but in, then in implementing um, and in enforcement of regulations. Often information is not necessarily being used as it could or should be. Um, so, and that's, that's a huge challenge of, of building that capacity. And Rodrigo, you had mentioned- yeah, in, in, in our case, there is this absolutely no institutional arrangement that, that obligate in some legal way to use research. Uh, now, I, I, was, I was mentioned before, we have inside our parliament a mm -hmm. special unit that provides scientific advice in case uh, a Congress people want to that advice. But I, I've been uh, attending many, many uh, meetings in the parliament and and citations are, are sometimes ridiculous. Even parliaments can cite uh, things that appear on Wikipedia, and, and, and there is no like I'm a, 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 a way of, 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 of filter the information that you can obtain from uh, uh, many sources. So, so yeah, this is completely non-formal. Although uh, parliaments are also trying to engage with local experts uh, and I've been invited many times to go to the parliament to, to talk about specific topics, but uh, this is just a, a voluntary uh, thing that is nothing uh, uh, official on, in terms of arrangement. In David, I, yeah, I would like to correct myself actually on one thing, and I think this is probably true in many other countries, is that there is one legislation that does actually legally require the use of scientific information, and that's in the environmental impact processes. You know, in Kenya, our legislation is perhaps 15 years old, so it's, you know, quite recent. Um, and environmental impact assessments have to be done, you know, using uh, standardized or accepted monitoring and scientific approaches and look at the literature. But you know, the quality of the work that's done and the quality control of that work in the regulatory bodies is, is, often, is often almost non-existent. Um, and then when you come out with the decisions from that process, you, you get things happening uh, with almost no monitoring and, and real enforcement based on the scientific information that's, that, is, that is present, but is just not being used, it's being ignored. If, if I could come back as well, because I'm watching the comments um, in the comment box. I think um, there's no legal requirement other than things like EIA process, but I think the powerful role of scientific researchers partnering with civil society who can add, who can interpret science, package it well, and actually do the advocacy to, to channel and promote that science be part of a policy making. I think that's a powerful route, both for, for EIAs, but, but policy making in general. And actually that's a good segue into a question that we've kind of combined from the audience. I'm going to read it out here. Um, it's, um, do you have any, you know, and this is for any of you to, to answer if you have an answer. Do you have any protocols to make sure researchers are respecting local or indigenous cultural practices. Um, and so maybe how could you identify local sensitivities and priorities prior to initiating research, particularly with respect to indigenous people and in regions that have had, not had had significant prior kind of research investment. So any kind of protocols um, to respect local practices, kind of that local partnership, designing the research to benefit the, the, the people at kind of a site specific. Um, I guess shall I, I'll, I'll just jump in then. So, yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm an ecologist, so I, I don't know the specifics of the social science um, and ethics behind that. But of course, Kenya has a permitting process. All foreign researchers have to get a research permit in order to do that. You have to submit the proposal, the partners you're working with, um, but then also an ethics uh, review uh, to some extent. And of course, the more you work on, on, on social issues and human subjects, the the, the more there is around that. 
But then, of course, the, the other the complement to that is really working either with or through a local partner, whether it's a research partner or an NGO or a facilitating body that can really link to the local community and make sure that consultation happens locally to identify priorities and sensibilities and so on. So again, I, I think I'd say the, the basic structures and guidance are in place for that, um, but the degree to which it happens, of course, will, will vary from, from case to case. Okay, I'm gonna read another one of the top questions we have distilled here. Um, and again, any one or all persons can, can answer. Um, what mechanisms are in place to, or envision to sponsor young people from local communities to be empowered to address communities' needs? And I guess, I guess we're kind of trying to drive the linkage between how can we be making our research more impactful? So are there any mechanisms in place or envision to help sponsor young people from local communities? to be empowered to address their research and, and community needs. I'll take <laughs> go, a go stop. Ahead, uh, um, just two thoughts, so I don't know about a mechanism, but two thoughts are that uh, where there are local young scientists um, studying, obviously, how can they be integrated into research? And Canary is quite intrigued with can we offer more internships? Um, so can, can local institutions offer more internships which receive some support from international partners, whether it's an international university or a foreign university? Can we partner um, students from a foreign university who maybe don't understand the local context, but bring that bigger exposure that David talked about. Um, they've had the benefit of studying abroad, have a broader perspective, but partner them with lo local youth, um, young scientists, so that that local relevance is matched with the, the bigger picture thinking and access to more resources as well. Um, just to throw some ideas into the mix and certainly for the uh, local and traditional knowledge researchers and the citizen scientists, I think um, using participatory information communication technology. You can use mobile phones for just tons of excellent research and young people are really attracted to that. And we've had a really good response on that, um, you know, just that informal citizen science. Thanks. Yeah, uh, uh, Peter, I just want to mention something very briefly uh, in, in relation to, to the previous question, and, and it's also connected with this one. In, in, in the case of Chile, we actually have a special program, it's a government funded program uh, um, to estimate the impact of policies in general. Um, so so the, it's, it's, a, it's a fair amount of funding um, to, to, to provide to, to research uh, uh, centers uh, in, in scientific research to provide scientific evidence on, on, on impact. But, but the problem with that is that uh, sometimes those evaluations are being linked uh, to uh, uh, decisions about budget from those programs, you see? So, so, so you go, you jump from from one extreme to the next uh, because now you are using science to uh, make budget decisions. Um, um, so, so that's of course create a lot of problem. But, but I would say that one of the the, the problems is uh, because you are going to make budget decisions based on this evidence. If if the policy is 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 declaring a specific objective you have to um, um, provide scientific evidence on the impact on that objective. So if there are externalities in terms of social or economic impact, because we're talking about environmental policies, that is something that is not relevant for the budget decision, you see? So, so we are losing a, a, very, a very good opportunity to continue with this uh, culture of providing rigorous evidence on impact of policies. Um, but adding this uh, story underneath. So one thing is to estimate the impact of a policy and, and another complete, completely different thing is providing a causal explanation of that impact. 
And, and in order to provide a good causal explanation, you need to understand what are the externalities in terms of the positive and negative externality. What are the connections with local communities? What are the, the social impact of, of a policy that is, is, is mainly aimed to protect the environment? So, so I think we are losing a, a very good opportunity. Uh, in, in my own experience as a, as a faculty member in probably one of, one of the a, a biggest university in Chile, uh, nothing prevents young scientists to engage in research. Uh, this is, again, this is just a, a, a matter of sometimes funding because funding is a big issue here. Uh, there are so many important things that you need to uh, cover with public funds and science is not a top priority and it's not gonna be after the pandemic, of course. So, so sometimes this is just a, a, a fight to get funding, but, but, but uh, if, if you get the funding, uh, in, in my case, um, we are starting a project to study the, source, the, the causal mechanism that explain the, the social impact of conservation policies. Uh, and I'm already adding a bunch of young researchers that are gonna study, for example, the, the cultural, uh, uh, impact of conservation policies uh, at, at the at the very local level. You see, but, but, but it's because I have the funding. <laughs> I think there, uh, that's a good um, segue or transition into another question we have here, and uh, maybe I'll direct this at David since you had kind of brought it up in your in your your talk. Um, we have a question asking about how can basic researchers like taxonomists um, avoid parachuting? Um, for example. Basic research doesn't have to have obvious appeal to local interests, but it's integral to other supporting research that does serve those interests. The notion that research should only serve policy needs is a hard pill to swallow for scientists who see their work as apolitical. What's your kind of general advice for them? Yeah, so that's certainly a tough question. And certain sciences like taxonomy, of course, require a huge amount of expertise that is going to be concentrated in a few people wherever they might be located, whether they're in Kenya or India or South Africa or anywhere. And those researchers getting samples from around the world, um, it needs to happen to advance the science. Uh, it's a really big challenge to make that information that science and the outputs accessible to the country where you know, a sample might have come from and so on. And sometimes that work takes 10 years before it comes out because of all the delays involved. So I think there's some basic challenges there in science communication, of course, and, and reporting that, that we just have to continually try and address and try and make sure that, that there's no exploitative relationship around it and that there's, there's not an unfair um, a polarization of of sort of power um, in those sorts of things. Um, and then I think the other thing is really to, yeah, to focus on, it's come up several times already, is the, collabor the collaborative uh, role of, of scientists in different places to work together to help make one another's um, res research more available and accessible. Um, I, I We may have been. David is frozen. Is it only on my end? Yeah, yeah. We have some communication challenges. Uh, hopefully, you'll come back to us in in short. Peter, order. Peter can I jump with uh, into yep. something um, in relation with, with, with your question? In in Chile, is is happening something that is very interesting. I I don't know. I don't have an explanation of, because there is no incentive to do that. Um, if, if, you, if you want to fund a research, the, the, always the most expensive part of that research is the field work, is to go to the field, collect the data. Um, so, so right now there is this, um, 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 this thing about uh, citizen science. I mean, scientific research conducted by like amateur scientists, uh, people that are in the field, and they provide good data. Um, and so for some reason, uh, there is, 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 is now a whole network of these uh, citizen uh, uh, scientists that are providing very interesting data um, uh, around like many, many issues, many topics. So, so 
and and there is no incentive for that. This is it's pure uh, uh, like people that are concerned about the environment that want to help in some way, and there is always people in the field doing things. Uh, so 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 they they are providing very very valuable resources. So that, that that's something that we should highlight also uh, in Chile is happening, and I don't know why, but but it's interesting. Solutions. Um, Nicole, I have a question here that you might be able to answer. I think uh, I think um, Robin Mahan typed it in. Um, so he asked, I would be interested in hearing panelists' views on the need to explicitly promote boundary-spanning organizations. Um, they are just emerging at a regional level in the wider Caribbean, and the policy-making organizations are not really clear on what their role could be and how to engage with them. Um, so if Anybody could have a, because uh, I or explain a little bit more about these boundary spanning organizations that Robin might be mentioning. Thanks for that tough question, Robin. <laughs> I think you are obviously much better placed to answer that. Um, Robin does a lot of work on governance and governance at different levels, local, national, regional, global, and the linkages between them. Um, and of course, there's a big effort in the wider Caribbean um, to see how we can better coordinate governance, have shared governance, um, because we are sharing ocean resources. So um, I think like Robin, I like openness, I like linkages, I like collaboration, I like partnerships. I think there's some practical challenges where mandates are restricted, um, you know, where, where organizations are set up with a certain mandate and it then becomes difficult for them to expand. Um, I think there are power issues um, between organizations, between countries, and there's a practical challenge, for example, in the Caribbean of language, where we have multiple languages going on and, you know, Africa and um, many other regions face this as well. So I think there are some practical challenges, but the, the scientists know that ecosystems are, are connected and we need to manage um, in interconnected holistic ways. So I think how can we address those challenges and face those realities but form the kind of collaborations and partnerships that can make it work. Um, so Robin, thank you for that. Thanks. And I think we have a few more minutes for a few more questions. There is um, there is a question that came in, and I think it also related to a, a comment ma made by David again, um, and I'll just read it. Um, and then perhaps I think all of you may have some input. Um, so there is, I'm gonna distill it as best as possible. There's a lot of effort to make scientific publications open access, but there's one challenge is still the lack of open access to the journals that scientists often want to publish in because of pressure from academic institutions. And there's still a block to getting some important science into the policy arena without an additional process. Um, for example, republishing open access formats. Do you have any thoughts or possible solutions on how we could kind of get around this, because I think this is linked to the comments about getting the information out there that's been through a rigorous peer review process, but then working with kind of communication professionals to transform that information into ready, readily digestible um, and usable um, formats. So any thoughts on kind of the, the feel of kind of what's going on in scientific publications and how work from our regions um, can kind of make it past those barriers? Well, <laughs> yeah, well, this is a very sensitive topic, and and, 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 and my university, the Catholic University, is, is the biggest university in in Chile, um, one of the main in in terms of research, and um, so so for for my university, publication means everything. You see. So to get the tenure, um, the, 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 you, you need to publish in high impact journals. Um, so sometimes uh, open source could provide a, a very interesting 
uh, alternative because you, you can you can reach more people so you can have more citations uh, but, but sometimes you really don't understand this very well so so if if i i'm going to publish in econometrica or something very very high quality in economics uh probably very very few people have access to those kind of journals uh, but but if i if i publish in an open source um uh, I'm going to reach much more people, but 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 my my evaluation is is going to be is going to be harmed in in some in some way. So so incentives aren't I, always I, I, aligned. I don't, I don't have I don't have a a, a a a a clear conclusion about that. Even even in 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 the extreme, there, there is this uh, possibility of publishing systematic reviews of scientific evidence those those are very useful collection of of, of evidence uh, but sometimes even systematic reviews in my case are not considered true publications so so they, those don't don't count either you see so there is a complete misalignment of incentives if i can add to that quickly peter on open access publishing. I mean, that for many scientists in developing countries, that's not actually a solution because you have to come up with the money to pay to have your paper published rather than being published by the consumer with the information. And that's a, and that's a huge barrier um, that, that we have to come up with. There are some great programs about better sharing and providing funding for that and, uh, and waivers of the, of the, of the the charges and so on, but there's, you know, it's not universal yet. I think we'll be struggling with this for, for quite some time. I need, I need a good business. I mean, if, if you want to go for the open side option in some journals, it's incredibly expensive. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they provide the alternative uh, of, of publishing an, an, open, an open source, but it's so expensive that it's sometimes prohibited. So, yeah. It's a big problem. I know we're winding down to time, so I have a lightning round question um, that was provided by one of our audience members. Um, is there a positive way you would suggest to briefly describe what we're trying to achieve in avoiding some of the things we spoke about in terms of parachute research? Um, for example, you know, empower local research partnerships. Do you have any other phrases that you would re recommend that would be good? How can we reframe? kind of working better, kind of like merging these issues. I know certainly it probably is more of an issue in Africa and the Caribbean than it is for certainly in Chile, as Rodrigo, we had chatted before, but any kind of other positive ways to reframe what we're talking about? I, I don't have, a, I don't have the, the magic phrase that covers it all, but I think actually what we're talking about is equity. And it's not just equity about, you know, the, the subjects of research, perhaps in terms of communities versus scientists, but it's equity between scientists across countries uh, and systems and so on. And uh, if we can, so reframing it around that issue, I think we, we can come a lot better. Very powerful. Nicole? I just agree with David, who is very mm -hmm. eloquent. Um, mm -hmm. I think I agree, equity is the word. You know, you're looking at collaboration, you're looking at meaningful, relevant partnerships. Um, even the word empower implies that someone is giving someone else power. Um, so even words like empower sometimes can can be negative, but equity is is I think a really central concept. So I agree with David. Uh, I would add science relevant, um, Peter. Your sign is going to be more relevant uh, if if you do that. I mean, you don't know. All the answers, and sometimes you come up with stories to to make sense out of your data, but you know you don't have that local context, uh, the local knowledge. Um, you you have come up with some story that makes sense, but uh, but your science could improve a lot by engaging with with local people. Thank you. So I think we're out of time. Um, Sarah, are there any other kind of logistical issues? I know this presentation or this webinar was um, recorded and I, I, I think we'll probably go through some of the questions and where we can forward some of the questions to our panelists to provide more substantive answers, we will. Um, 
thank you all again for um, my panelists to, for, for presenting on this topic. We gave ourselves just an hour because we could probably spend two hours discussing this topic, but I think it was very engaging. And, um, and I know that, I, I know that they, the Octo Network folks are having a de dedicated webinar on parachute science, where we can delve into those topics a little more deeply. We were trying to round this around research impact and how that could be improved. But thanks everyone again, and um, see you next time. Thank you, Peter. Thank bye you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye.